intervals, the first 10 minutes or so. And then we're going to move into the mirror exercise. So we're actually going to sing that today. And I'm going to kind of show you guys a little bit of how you might do this on your own as well. It's also new to most people that are late to change it. So all you have to do is just listen to me right now. perfect fifth mirror exercise because that's what we're working on right now and I'm just going to play this on the piano and we're going to sing this as a class <coughs> and I'm going to sing along with you I don't have a great voice so be prepared for that here's your first note let's go ahead and match that pitch e. we're just going to sing P5 so those are the syllables we use so it'll be like P5 P5 good all right here we go we're only going to go about four, maybe five lines. We'll see how high I can go before I give out. One, two, ready, go. P5, 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 So you could go as high as you're able to, or start in a range where it's more comfortable for you. You could start much lower, you do whatever you like. But that's the idea. Right now, those are the two main exercises you guys should be working on to develop your ear. I don't want you to worry too much about the ear training assignment, because I do some things to kind of even out your grades a little bit in those as the semester progresses. You'll have some other options to bring your grade up if you just can't develop your ear. Because you're not a musician, some of you might be, 
but this isn't a music major course, so I don't expect you to develop this amazing ear, but I do expect you to try. And so I have some options available if you are trying, but it's just not working. So we're going to kind of go over chapters two through four today. And the way this class works, especially in the first couple weeks, we might not always go the entire length of class. It's pretty much, I go until I'm done talking about what I need to talk to, then I let you guys leave. Uh, second half of the year, after midterm, rarely do we get out early. So just know this class does go till 9.45. Even though you're probably going to get out before 9.30, it is So what we're going to be talking about today is really how music theory is useful for the different types of musicians that you might consider being or that exist within the field of music. Basically, music theory, it sort of bridges that gap between what we all kind of know instinctually about music most of us can listen to a melody, we know when it begins, we know when it ends, we know where the high point is. We can just understand that because we've lived with it our entire lives and it seems to be sort of an inborn ability. These presentations are all online, by the way. If you go to harmony.uremusic.com, you'll find them. They're just in the right-hand sidebar. And I also post the videos from the lectures in there. So you can review this if you need to. All right, but getting back to this, theory provides a concrete way of talking about a form that is very abstract. I mean, sound, it's hard to describe, right? But what we're learning right now, these intervals, they're called perfect hits. So if you know what a perfect hit sounds like and you know what it looks like on the page, then if you hear a perfect hit, which is a very, very common interval in music, you can say to another musician, hey, that perfect fifth right there, it was a little out of tune, or bring out that perfect fifth every time you hear it. It's an important part of this composition. You can talk more intelligently about music, and that's really why we learn music theory. Because otherwise, we're just using very abstract terms to talk about music, and nobody knows what you're talking about. It would change every time you met with a new musician. You'd have to invent a new vocabulary that only you two understood. So the whole idea is just give you a way to talk about music quickly. Another aspect of it is that we have a lot of different styles of music. You got your classical music, romantic, medieval music. Different time periods have different styles. If you learn music theory, then you can very quickly understand the important aspects of the classical period. You can learn a hundred years worth of music by learning a couple theories, ideally. And the thing about music theory, at least for the classical period, romantic period, these major periods, the theory that holds is the theory based on the most popular composers or whoever theory society the most representative of that time. So we're mainly talking about Western music here. And what that means is in the classical period, theorists said, okay, we've got Mozart, Beethoven, these are important composers. They did a lot of things that were very similar, that were in common with each other. So we're going to base classical theory off what, what they did, and we're going to judge every other composer of that time based on Mozart and Beethoven, which is a little bit unfair, but that's what they do. They, they look back in time and they say, what's the most popular music from that time period? Let's figure it out and see why it became so popular. And they do that for every time period. So if I am looking at a piece I've never seen before and it's a classical music piece and I know the composer lived in the classical period, then I can very quickly understand some basic principles about how this piece should be played. So that's ultimately the goal of theory. Rather than having to sit down and sit through hundreds of scores and try and just use your ear to hear the similarities between these pieces, you can learn theory, and it's kind of like the Cliff's Notes for music. It gives you the basic concepts that are important for that particular time. So that's why we concentrate so much on theory. So these are some of your most common types of musicians. There's obviously 
quite a few that aren't listed on here. You've got music producers, you've got DJs. But when it comes to Western music, these are probably the most common ones you're gonna come across. And we're gonna talk very briefly about each of these. I think this should be in chapter two of your textbook. The textbook goes into more detail. I'm just kind of giving you the broad overview and maybe giving you a little more context to view the textbook. But basically, what you need to know about a theater, they don't create anything new. That's not their job. I'm not saying that a theorist can't compose a new work. A lot of theorists also act as composers. But the strict job title of a theorist type Yep, we got it right. Right. <laughs> Don't mind my Okay, that's our director of music there. <laughs> All right, so the music theorists, they don't create anything new. What they do is they look at what already exists and they figure out how it works, okay? And they are there to figure out common trends and basically if you follow the guidelines that a theorist lays out, you could reproduce a piece that sounds like it fits within a particular style of music. So you learn that in the classical period, they like to move from this chord to this chord in this particular way. And it might not sound new or engaging, but it's gonna sound correct if you follow theory. And that, that's the whole idea. They basically just create systems so that musicians have a better understanding of how to analyze music. So that brings us to composers. This is really my field, and what they do is they try and create new sounds. At least if you're talking about academic composers. A lot of composers that write popular music, they're not necessarily creating new chords or new sounds in their music. They're using a lot of the building blocks, the chords and the triads and all that that already exist, and it's more about creating a message or an interesting song. But they're using elements that already exist. What a more academic composer will try and do is create a chord that nobody's heard before. And it's not just about creating a new chord, it's about trying to figure out how to fit that new chord into something maybe that already exists or to create an entirely new structure so that you got something new for people to listen to and learn from. And a lot of times what happens is a classical composer will write something that's really academic and out there and nobody likes, and then a more commercial composer will come along and say, I can make this more interesting, I can make this more accessible. So they kind of work together in that way. In that way, there's a lot of really interesting chords out there that have come about through classical music. Because the classical composer tends to get into things like the overtone series, how music actually functions, and then they create a new palais of sounds to be used. Uh, before music theory existed, people didn't always learn to write music through using music theory. There was something called counterpoint, which we're not gonna get into, but it was basically a way of combining multiple melodies so that they sounded good together. So if I were to, I'm not a pianist, but I'm gonna try and give you a little example here. They'd have, for instance, maybe two melodies, one would be slow and one would be fast. So you could hear both melodies at the same time. So maybe this is your slow melody. Very simple. And then they might add another melody on top of it. So that's not, that wouldn't follow counterpoint rules because there's some dissonance in there but they created these rules for how the different voices should move together to sound good together. And that's really how Mozart taught other people and Haydn and Beethoven learned a lot of counterpoint. So it's pretty important for composers of the time. All right, so an arranger is kind of like a composer in some ways. They don't necessarily create anything new, but they do create an existing piece. They take an existing piece and they try and do something new with it. So whether that's as simple as, I've got a piece for piano, I wanna write it for an orchestra, that's something an arranger might do, or they might wanna take a piece and turn it from like a happy song 
into something a little more sad and minor. Like you guys know that song, Are You Sleeping? <laughs> an arranger might go and turn it into something different, like minor. Which gives it an entirely different meaning. It's like, are you sleeping? Suddenly it becomes minor, it's a little darker. So they can, they have this palette of chords and tools at their disposal so that they can create something different out of something that already exists. But they're not creating something entirely new. They're just taking what already exists and saying, this is a popular melody. Everybody knows what it means. Everybody knows the lyrics to Are You Sleeping? If I turn it minor, suddenly it's a funeral march. It has a completely different meaning. So they can do things like this because they know what exists in terms of chords and chord progressions, intervals, and all the stuff you're going to learn about. And they can basically turn it into something that has a completely different message. Uh, the one thing about arrangers is you can actually be an arranger without being able to hear your music at all. If you learn music theory, then you can put a piece together that sounds good, but you really need to be able to hear the piece as well. These are probably the most important people in music because if you don't have performers, nothing gets performed. I mean, now you've got computers that can perform a lot of music, but <clears throat> computers aren't quite there yet to produce the same level of performance that a performer does. I mean, if you go to a concert, you don't go to hear the latest computer perform. You go to hear that person who you got an interest in perform, right? So there still has to be kind of that human for a lot of music. But they find that theory helps them when understanding new works. If they get a new piece they've never seen before, and maybe the world's never seen it before, and they understand theory, then they can go through and they can say, okay, well, this is common, this is common, and this is something I've seen in theory. And then they can say, this is something that's new. So since this one thing is new, I know that that must be important. This composer must have said, hey, I like this, this is kind of cool. So the piece might actually rely upon this new chord that the composer's created. And you only know it's a new chord if you know theory. So it also makes memorizing a piece easier because if you're playing in a performance and you're, you're like an opera singer, for instance, and you're singing a three hour opera, generally, Opera singers have incredible memory, but they also use music theory to keep track of the different sections in a piece. Like if you have a chord progression, okay, well, the, that sounds like a progression that has a beginning, middle, and end to most of you, but a performer with a really good ear would recognize the specific progression and they'd be able to hear it again in a piece. And so they would know that's the 5-1 progression, is what we call it. <coughs> and when they hear that, they might know, okay, this is the end of this section, and if they get lost, they can get back on track because they've analyzed the score, they've learned how it works, and so they have a mental visual image of the music as well as their aural and basically just their memorization, okay? So theory helps performers understand new works. And the one theme between all these performers and composers and arrangers is that theory gives a common language for them to understand how to communicate with other musicians. Make sense? All right. Anybody know what a conductor is? You ever heard that term? Yeah. Other than train conductor? guys that get up in front and they start conducting, right? They give the beat for the piece. But they don't always do that. I performed with one conductor. He was uh, the president's own Navy band. He didn't conduct the beat. He conducted the offbeat. And it took me a while to figure out what was going on because I was just there for like a guest performance. 
And all the other musicians I was there with for the guest performance were like, what is going on here? And then we figured out it wasn't the conductor conducting the beat, it was the first clarinetist who was conducting the beat. So the first clarinetist is sitting up there giving the beat, and the conductor's just doing a stylistic thing to look good for the audience, number one. But more importantly, he's giving the cues for different entrances, and he was shaping the way that the melody should sound. So he was using his hands to try and like, visually shape the melody, which was an interesting way of doing it, and a lot of conductors will do that. So conductors traditionally just got up there to beat time and to help keep the entire ensemble in sync. But as that whole field's developed, now they have a much wider role. And without theory, they can't look at a score and figure out what's going on. There's a composer called Gustav Mahler. He's, in a lot of ways, the guy that's responsible for most of the sounds we hear in film music, like Harry Potter type stuff. There are so many chords that came from Mahler. And one of the things that he does in his music is he's got this major minor progression. It just, it's two chords. And this symbolizes a sort of hope followed by despair that's in his music. But you wouldn't necessarily know that sequence of chords was important unless you really understood theory. And you saw that it was used after every major point of the piece. So a conductor that knows theory can go through and they can analyze the music and they can understand better what the intentions of the composer was because if you see that major minor progression over and over again, you're gonna say, he's using this in the exact same way in different parts of the piece, this must be important. So then you know that I gotta bring that out. I gotta make sure this major minor chord comes out even if there's another melody going on at the same time. And so that's the kind of thing that makes theory useful for a conductor. It's just that a lot of times what conductors will do is they will actually listen to other conductors' performances but there reaches a point where you have to create your own interpretation of a piece, and that's when music theory can actually become helpful for that. Because if you know what a composer's thinking, then you can better interpret it. And one point of contention between conductors and composers that I don't really agree with, the composers always try and tell the conductor how to perform the composer's piece. And I get that. The composer wrote it. I'm a composer, I understand that. I have a certain idea of what my piece should sound like. But every conductor can only conduct with their own unique style. So you have to allow for that. And the composer and conductor can get together. This is why maybe conductors like to perform dead people's music because they're not there to argue. But you get together and the conductor knows what can actually happen in performance. Composers don't always know what can happen and how a piece should be performed most effectively. So I believe that most composers should defer to the conductor, but they often argue on little things, little stylistic things, which I think it's a problem because the conductor, if he has one unique vision, if you try and put another one in there, then it suddenly seems like a mismatch of ideas. Okay, the final one, which any of you guys thinking about becoming music educators, taking this as a survey course? Sometimes I have a lot of educators in here, or people who don't necessarily want to teach music, but think they're going to go into the field of education and music's useful to know about. If you're going to be an educator, you need to know theory almost better than a theorist, because the thing about music that makes it complicated is that there's usually three or four different ways of learning the same thing. So there are multiple ways of learning how to create major and minor scales. There's multiple ways of thinking about intervals. There's multiple ways of doing a lot of different things in music. And if you don't know all the different methods for teaching and understanding this, it makes it harder to teach to a large group that might not understand method one, but they get method two or method three. So the educator really needs to know theory so they can explain it to people more effective way. So basically what this all comes down to is music theory, it does two things really. It 
provides a common language for musicians, and it explains how music is created, okay? That's really what music theory is for. I talked a little bit about this yesterday. I'm just gonna go over this because it's in the textbook, but you've got <coughs> the core. You've got the textbook and then the audio package and workbook. They're two different components. The textbook will go over some of the stuff that I talk about now in more detail. The audio package and workbook is designed to build your ear, to train your ear to be a little more effective, okay? So, we talked about how to use all that stuff, so I'm not gonna go over that again. I'm also gonna post a video, it's about 10 minutes long. If you still don't understand how to use these audio files, this will teach you how to do it. You can watch that if you need some further explanation. But the important thing here, if you want to develop your oral ability, that's oral, not oral, okay? There's a, there's a difference. Oral has to do with the ear, okay? Oral, coming out of the mouth, right? So if you want to develop your oral ability, then it takes some time. Some of you, the first time you hear a perfect fifth, and I tell you that's a perfect fifth, you're gonna say, oh, okay, I never knew that, but now you'll recognize it every single time you see it. Some people just have an ability to learn intervals really quickly. Some people can actually hear specific pitches. Like if I go to the piano and I play a random pitch, they'll know that's a D, and they can tell me that. I don't have that ability, it's called perfect pitch, but some people can do that. And the way they do it is because they can hear the way the vibrations interact. And each note actually has its own characteristic sound, which you can develop the ability to hear, but it's not really as useful a skill as being able to hear what we call relative pitch. So there's relative and there's perfect pitch. Perfect pitch is hearing specific intervals and notes and knowing exactly what they are. Like you could say that's a note C, D, E, whatever it is. Relative is just relatively knowing if I play two notes, that's a perfect fifth. Or if I play a smaller interval, that's a major third. So relative pitch is just knowing the relationship between notes. But one thing I can do, and maybe about half of you will hear this when I do it, because as soon as you explain this to someone, they start to say, oh yeah, I just never thought about it. It's like everybody can see colors. Well, most people can see colors. But you don't really have to think about it because you've been taught from an early age what these names are. We don't do that with music. But if I were to play an F sharp here, the F sharp, I'm gonna describe it as having kind of um, a sharp sound. It sounds a little bit rough and a good note to compare that to is a really soft one, which is an E flat. Even if I hit the E flat really hard, it sounds somewhat softer than the F sharp. Can anybody hear what I'm talking about? So you can hear how there's a difference in the quality, and it's not the piano. If the piano is out of tune, then it would be an issue. But you can do that in any octave. The F sharp. The E flat just seems somehow more relaxed, more sunken in, a little more mellow. And so people with perfect pitch, they just learn to recognize these 12 different pitches and they hear this characteristic sound and they say, that's an F sharp. I know it is. Because for whatever reason, they can remember this. So with intervals, when you're listening to a perfect fifth, you're doing the same thing. But instead of trying to identify individual notes, you're just listening to the interval. So this interval is one of the most open sounding intervals we have. It's clear. It almost sounds like one note, but you can hear there's two there. So then you go down to a perfect fourth. That one sounds a little crunchier. We call it maybe a little more dissonant than the perfect fifth. It just seems like the fifth is lighter, more clear. The fourth is a little more closed in. And 
and some intervals are easier to tell apart from others in a comparison. So if I were to do a perfect fifth and a major third, most of you are going to hear the difference right away. Oops. So your first ear training assignment is actually to, it's basically an assignment on the perfect fifth because I'm trying to get you guys to hear the perfect fifth, but you've only got a perfect fifth and a major third for that entire assignment. It's one or the other. And I'm doing that because those are two of the easier intervals to hear. So the major third, because it's a third, is going to be closer in distance than a perfect fifth. So what you're listening for in this assignment is the interval that is further away is going to be the fifth. The interval that is closer together is a third. Does that kind of make sense? Don't expect to get 100%. A lot of you are right now, which is good. But just do your best. Uh, the other thing, so if you want to develop your ear and you want to start to actually do well on these ear training exams, the assignments, you should practice 10 minutes a day. Just listen to the intervals, do the mirror exercise. That's really enough. If you want to spend a little more time, I wouldn't do more than 30 minutes a day. The maximum amount of time you should spend is an hour. And the reason for that is because the ear can be very delicate. If you do too much, then you'll actually start to overwhelm it and you'll start to see negative progress. So there is sort of a maximum amount of time per day and that's an hour. And if any of you are doing an hour a day, good for you, just make sure you stop when everything starts sounding the same because at that point you're not helping yourself. But 10 minutes a day, when I taught this class in the past, I only, had them listen to intervals when they came into class on Tuesday and Thursday. And that was enough for about 80% of them to develop the ability to hear the difference between the four major intervals that we worked on. So now that you have these tools to practice at home, you should be able to see better gains if you practice each day. So this is what I kind of talked about. The ear isn't a muscle. You can't build it up to engage in stronger, longer ear training sessions. You want to keep them fairly short so that you don't overwhelm it. But the important thing is when you're working on these mirror exercises, you don't really want to make mistakes. You want to be careful and try and match the pitch as accurately as possible because the brain, and this is true with everything, it doesn't differentiate between a mistake and something that's correct. All it knows is that you've done something correctly 10 times and one time you did it incorrectly. So it's like, well, the 10 times he did it this way is probably the way he wants it. But there's always that one time where you did it incorrectly that is lurking there somewhere as a possibility and you'll make mistakes later on if you learn something incorrectly. It's very hard to unlearn something once you've learned it the wrong way. And that's really true for any skill. So it's important to go slow and to really concentrate on getting the right notes when you're singing these exercises. There is an app, there's lots of apps. You can get a tuning app that will actually tell you what note you're singing. And I'm gonna put up some links to that so you guys can download them. But while you're singing, if you want, if you don't have a piano, which most of you probably don't, you can use this free app and it will tell you what note you're singing. And it'll tell you whether or not you're high or low on the note. So you can use that to try and match pitch. If you're not quite at a point where you can tell if you're high or, or low. It's important. Mistakes are hard to forget. Okay, we talked about that. Real quick, you don't want to move past the perfect fifth right now. Just concentrate on the perfect fifth. I know the assignment has a major third in there but you're not training your ear to hear major thirds right now. You're training them to hear perfect fifths. So while, even though you have all the intervals available to you right now, only listen to the perfect fifth. And that's important because you don't want to overwhelm your mind with too many different intervals. You need to learn one really well before you move on to the next one. If this wasn't part of the course, I would tell you, stay on the perfect fifth until you can hear it very clearly, until it starts popping out of the music you listen to. 
we don't really have time for that because we got to move past it. But if you decide to continue this when you leave this course, then stay on each interval until it's really clear. And it could take a year or more. But if you develop your ability to hear intervals, it changes the way you perceive music. It's just a completely new experience. It's like you've got a black and white TV. And yes, there's artistic merits to black and white television. But you've got your black and white TV. And you can basically understand the plot line. You know what's going on. You know the character's name. But you don't know what kind of day it is necessarily. You don't know what colors the main character is wearing. Developing your ear is like changing from a black and white TV to a color television in a way. Because you suddenly see, hear a lot more information. So it's kind of a useful skill to have. And if you guys are interested in learning languages, developing your ear is a great way to do that. All right, so basically, just some listening tips. Don't get frustrated. Don't worry if you don't feel like you're progressing. If you're listening for 10 minutes a day, you are. I promise you, you're getting better. You may not realize it, but you are. It won't happen in an incremental, slow progression. It'll happen more in steps. Like all of a sudden, you'll notice that, oh, I can hear a perfect fifth. And it might happen overnight after like three months of trying to hear a fifth. All of a sudden, you'll hear it everywhere. And that's just kind of how it works. One thing that does happen, and I think this is actually probably the next slide. No, okay. But one thing that does happen is as you develop your ear, some intervals were really easy to hear suddenly become confusing. And this isn't because your ear is getting worse. It's because your brain now has more information to deal with. So that is actually a sign you're improving. If you could hear an octave, most people can say that's the same note an octave higher. It's one of the easiest intervals for people to just start ear training to hear. But what happens every single time I teach this to my music majors is about halfway through the semester they can't hear an octave anymore. And they, they feel like their ear is getting worse. And then they keep going by the end of the semester they're able to hear the octave again. It's because the brain is trying to like process all this information. It's very subtle and it just gets confused. But it's a sign you're actually improving when the intervals you used to know before are harder to hear. So don't get concerned if all of a sudden you can't hear certain intervals that used to pop out of you. Once you learn all 12, you kind of have this for life. I mean, I haven't done ear training in years, but I still hear all these intervals. And the reason for that, partially, is because you listen to music. And once you know what these intervals sound like, you'll still register that I just heard a fourth and I just heard a fifth. So because music is something you have all around you when you're watching TV or whatever, you really don't need it. And this is the last thing, very simple. So one of your first theory assignments is to identify the notes on the piano keyboard, okay? So I color-coded these, but if you're colorblind, I guess that doesn't really help you too much. So moving from left to right, you start on C and you end on B, okay? So C, D, E, F, G, A, B. And then in between each of these keys, and this becomes really important later on. You'll, you'll see when we get to it. In between each key, you can either raise the pitch by a half step in which case we say you made it sharp, or you can lower a pitch by a half step, in which case it becomes flat. And this becomes confusing because these flat keys are actually known by two different names. So if this is a C and I raise it a half step, this becomes a C sharp, sharp because it's raised. If this is a D and I lower it a half step, D flat. it's a D flat. So C sharp and D flat are the same note. Okay? It didn't always used to be that way. C sharp and D flat actually used to be different notes. And then we simplified our system, we pushed all the notes together and made them all equal. Now C sharp and D flat are the same note. But we'll get into that later. So C, C sharp or D flat, D, D sharp or D flat. D flat, E. There's no black key here. 
So that means the difference between E and F is what? Half step. Half step, good. So E, F, and then F sharp or G sharp. And then we got G and then G sharp. Okay. G sharp. Okay. And now we're going down. Yeah. So pretty simple, right? So that's really the focus of this week. You're learning the notes on the piano keyboard. And this is going to make learning intervals really easy. This class starts out extremely easy. Now, when I said it's really easy to get an A or a B in here, it is if you do the assignments. Because what happens is you'll find each week the assignment builds. So the information you learned from the previous week, you'll actually be tested again on in the next week. So they're, they're drilled that way, and you'll continue to reinforce these topics while adding new information. Where it gets really hard for people is when we start to talk about intervals. They can handle scales and chords, those are usually pretty easy, but the intervals get really complicated.